<laughs> Hello, welcome to uh, the Political Vigilante. My name is Graham Elwood. We are here with Pasta and Fee from the Convo Couch, um, who were just talking to us about getting a uh, copyright strike from YouTube, which is a form of censorship. But you, uh, you also have been very active covering protests in the streets, not just here in Los Angeles, but also you went up to Portland, you've been to Seattle. And you're saying you're noticing an interesting kind of trend that's happening in the locations of the protest, because you were just at one in Beverly Hills, which people are starting to wake up that this is class warfare. So what did, what did you see today and what have you been seeing at some of these recent protests? Um, well, today, um, and this group of protesters are actually really good at doing this. They initially, when I when they first went out, they ha would stop by little um, areas and educate people on like what the dispensaries, for instance, they would talk about how many people are in jail. And at the same time, you know, there's dispensaries being run for profit for business. They would talk about the warehouses or the stores that would outsource labor in like Malaysia and use women and child uh, children for labor. They 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 started educating people, and so now they've gone back to Beverly Hills, and they're going through like Rodeo Drive in this area by Roxbury Park, and they started ta talking about you know capitalism, and they're t shouting "Eat the rich," and they want to go after the elite because what they're seeing is that the police have been extremely uh, violent towards them. But when it comes to protecting the rich areas, that's when they care about it. They don't really care about pr protecting South Central LA. They care about protecting the, the the elite. And you don't see any homeless in Beverly Hills, not because homeless people s decide that they're not going to go there, but because the police push them all the way out to the poor minority areas. That's what they do. And so, um, you know, seeing them kind of take on the shift and also seeing the young people there who have been protesting for racial justice start to realize that people who are uh, a lot like them and you know in race are actually on the other side standing with against them because they are silent and because they're complicit and because they are comfortable and they started talking about you are too comfortable in this you need to get out of uh, out of this this country is you know falling apart they're trying to wake people up to the fact that as rich as you think you might be as safe as you think you might be um a lot of these people, they're not going to be saved. They're also going to suffer. And I think it goes beyond the 1%. It goes to the 3%, to the 4%, all the way up to maybe perhaps the 15 to 20% of people who are trying to keep up with the Joneses, who are trying to be a part of the elitist system. And I think that's finally like getting into the minds of these protesters where it is, it's racial justice, but it's also class war. And that becomes very, very clear when you go up and you see a lot of minorities who are rich, so they don't care about the, the the racial struggle because they can buy their way out of it. And so that's that's something that may seem controversial to some, but I think that can bring a lot more people into this movement if we back it up by through the economic part. Pasta. So you were saying basically you were at a Black Lives Matter protest today in Beverly Hills, yep. which I'm sure was, you know, a, a Black people, Latinos, people of color, most of the Black Lives Matter protests I've seen in L.A. are sort of a wide range of mm -hmm. ethnicities, right? And then they're seeing, they thought it was just going to be rich white people in Beverly Hills, but no, there's people of color having brunch going, oh, I wish this protest would go away, basically. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people that that were extremely, uh, like, condescending and, you know, thinking that these kids don't have jobs, that these people don't, you know, aren't doing anything. And it's like, well, a lot of these people have jobs, but I mean, we're also in the middle of a pandemic and economic collapse. So maybe like how many, what's the percentage of people that aren't employed in Los Angeles, you know, but it's, it's, it's really, they're really realizing this. And I think it's another thing that's happening too, is the people are getting fed up with, with nothing getting done. Right. Because there's still being crimes committed against a lot of poor people and a lot of people of color. But a lot of poor people, are, the crimes are still being committed against them and the media has fallen silent on it. You notice that unless there's looting, looting or if there's anything that they can get a hold of, they don't talk about the protests. When the protests are peaceful, they they don't really care about them. It, it's only if, if they can find a way to really polarize people, you know, and um, I think I think there's some there's a way to that 
through the economics of it because it's going to affect so many people. It's going to affect more people than I think we know. And I and I hope we're wrong and I hope we're not you know, good at the economy isn't going to collapse. But just like you, I've been hearing very, very aware and intelligent economic uh, people who study economics literally say the dollar is going to go down. The economy is, is on the brink of collapse. And people are starting to realize that time is of the essence to really speak about these issues. Well, it's a great point, you know, because we live in this new era. It's not the 60s. I mean, there's obviously a lot of still that same stuff is happening in the, for, without a doubt. But like you say, back in the 60s, it was very clear. The white people had all the privilege and the people of color didn't. It was very clear. And there's still very much of that. Very a lot of privileged white right. people know two ways about it. But <laughs> there are, especially in Los Angeles, a lot of people of color who've made it. They've made they've successful and they now don't give a damn. They don't care. I mean, you look at this. You guys have been to how many Black Lives Matter protests about um, the uh, Jackie Lacey. The, she's mm -hmm. the district attorney in L.A. She's the most protested woman outside of the chief of police. She's a black woman. I mean, yep. I think people are waking up to this fact that, yes, there's systemic racism. Absolutely. But this is a, a you're seeing the powerful and the thing that the, the someone that's a millionaire, they think they're they're close to being a billionaire and they don't really understand math because if you make a million dollars a year, you are only nine hundred and seventy thousand dollars away from being making thirty grand a year, like having a really tough life in a city like Los Angeles. You are nine hundred and ninety nine. <laughs> Nine hundred and ninety nine million dollars away from being a billionaire. So you think you think, oh, that's does this this class war won't affect me. It will, because let me tell you something. If you if your industry or business collapses or you've got a million dollars in the bank and then there's a run on the banks and the bank says we'll only give you a thousand bucks of that million. Guess what? Now what? You can't afford to live in Beverly Hills. What are you going to do? And your rich friends aren't going to give a damn about you because they're going to go, oops, bye. We got to protect ourselves. I don't think people realize that this is class warfare and exactly. systemic racism, but this is a full on class warfare. And, you know, I had Christy I on the show who's on that show, Boomer Bust on RT. And she's telling me venture capitalists, um, investment hedge funds, people like that in this country, outside this country are shorting the dollar. And what that means to the viewer, they're basically betting against the dollar. They're betting yep. that the dollar collapses. So if these people are investing tens of millions of dollars, if not more, a, they, they got, they, they were, they are aware they're, they're not activists. They're not lefty act. They're, they're full blown capitalists and they just want to make a profit and they don't care who, how, or why. And if they're going to put all that money into shorting the dollar and the dollar collapsing, then they're going to probably make sure it happens at the very least not be sad about it because they made a profit. So that's the people that I'm hearing this from are not like, are not just the like Richard Wolfs of the world who I got mad respect for, but it's just like full blown capitalists who are just study the stock market and investing and all this stuff are saying it's coming. There's no way around it. And it, the election isn't going to matter. It's coming. And and it's going to bring the degree of civil unrest is going to be through the roof. Unfortunately, I'm, it makes me nervous. I'm scared about it. But they're like the, the George Floyd protests are going to look like a damn Disney parade. And I don't think people understand this. And they want to go to brunch in Beverly Hills and think it's all done. But I think all of America wants to just not pay attention. Like I was flipping through the channels and I'm watching football. I, I used to really care about it. And I, I don't care at all. And I was just curious to watch it. And boy, you watch an NFL game. There's no mention of COVID or black lives matter or anything. They just, I mean, I get their football and they just want to talk about their sports. And, but you, if you watch that in the advertisement, you would have no idea that we're like, there's wars in the streets. There's people getting shot. There's journalists getting arrested. There's shit collapsing. You'd have no idea. And I think some Americans just want to like, 
It's part open. of the great distraction. It's yep. part of the big distraction. Give them circuses and bread, and they'll never revolt. You'll see a, a bunch of Biden ads and a bunch of Trump ads left and right. The tribalism's still there going left and right. You know, one of our friends just got on it the other day, and I'm really thinking about this whole situation because as we're out there in the streets, I'm like, well, right now this protest is going to be kicked up a, a real big notch once the tsunami of evictions really does kick in. You know, and uh, we have a friend of ours, Mel, who just got on it the other day for giving people showers then and they said this crazy stat that he's given this many showers and this long and you know they had the ram mascot there honoring him from the la rams and you know whatnot but i, I started thinking to myself man mel's gonna be really busy come february because they have not presented any solutions and they start kicking people out of their houses also a lot of those people that were eating brunch because half of those people that were eating brunch Half of them are just pretending to be part of that 1%, 4%. They're going to have all their assets taken away from them and seized as well. So, uh, you know, I wonder what's to come for the future. But I am damn near, uh, damn near scared. You know, we heard some fuck Trumps out there. I would have liked to hear some fuck Bidens or fuck the system. Because it's really about the system that's going to really bring people down. And especially in February, it's going to get scary. And let me tell you something. Those people in Beverly Hills... They're not safe that these neighborhoods behind them start getting evicted in their houses. They're going to start. Do they think that that was bad what they saw today? You know, uh, no, that's just a little appetizer of what's to come unless we get this situation figured out. And it, we need our lawmakers to act and they are not acting. They're sitting back doing the same thing going, well, hey, hey, we feed them, Graham. We feed them. This is like. They make the French aristocracy of the 1700s seem a little more compassionate. Like yeah. it's unbelievable. They Don't literally, <laughs> they're doing absolutely nothing. Like it's, it's these two inept parties having some kind of like junior high slap fight over the next stimulus bill. Like, I mean, I think I'm going insane and I'm like, Steve Mnuchin is the one making sense. Steve Mnuchin. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess like, and, and I don't think, and you're right. Like, look, man, I saw it in Santa Monica the end of May, which Santa Monica is nice. It's a it's a nice beach town. It has rent control. It has some some kind of working class people. But for the most part, it's a fairly affluent, mostly white, nice beach town. And the riots came to Santa Monica and Santa Monica, the chief of police, she just resigned because she was a full blown idiot. Um yay, diversity. She was awful. She she had the police department only um go after the peaceful protesters and then left the promenade. She didn't, so that they, and they, they calculated it. People came in looted, starting loot specifically, and then everything went off the rails and the city of Santa Monica had still hasn't like recovered. There's still boarded up buildings. There's some places trying to open a bunch of my famous, my favorite uh, surf shop that had been there 32 years. ZJ's boarding house opened in June and July. And then in August it had to close. And that's just going to keep happening. And look, all of the, the, the city of LA came to Santa Monica and some people were there to peacefully protest and some people were there to, to, to fuck shit up. And I said yeah, yeah. to, you know, uh, someone that I ended, ended up having to like end a friendship with, they were so like, why are they pro? What are they? And I was like, I, I go, I'm not happy looting happened. I got into three arguments about this, all with baby boomer white people who lived in Santa Monica, by the way. Um, and I was like, look, I'm not happy that these riots happened in my town. It's it's scary, but I understand the economics of it. And I've been to South Central and it's not nice. It's not like Santa Monica. There's not a Jamba Juice and an REI and a Burke Williams and sushi. And so they got off the train and went, all right, the cops are busy. Shit, let's go. And, you know, it's it's what I was at that moment. That was May 31st. I hadn't gotten my unemployment yet at that point. I got my unemployment June 5th. So if I didn't have this show and I was just a road comic, I probably would have gone into the grocery store, the Vons that was looted, and put a mask on and brought a backpack and taken some food out of there. Cause I would have been like, at that point, I had only gotten the $1,200 at that point. So I don't know how I would have paid. I would have been like, it probably like, well, I'm not paying rent June 1st. Yeah. I'd be one of these comics now who maybe I'd finally got my unemployment and I'd maybe I'd, maybe I'd be up to speed on my rent. Maybe I'd be a couple months behind Maybe whatever, uh, maybe I'd be one of these comics, like oh, I'm going to go on the road and do shows and risk it in COVID or whatever, but I get it. I'm like, a, 
I'm a college educated white guy who's got no criminal record. And I was thinking about busting into a store and stealing food because I was fucking hungry. Now imagine yeah. if you've been born into that and there's, there's no hope. And then the cops can beat the shit out of you and kill you. And there's no repercussions. I'd be fucking furious. And they yeah. don't understand Beverly Hills and, and, and Brentwood and all these other, they don't understand like the, the Rodney King riots. Everybody came up Western Avenue <laughs> across the 10. That's what happened. And imagine that times 10. That was about one event, right? That was one event. Since we've had Breonna Taylor, I mean, Jacob Blake, I mean, it, it's on and on. On top of that, you take the economic thing we're talking about. You talk about all the evictions. You talk about uh, then sections of, of LA that are so rich and they're just like, oh, what are they protesting? Like, they're so out of touch and and... Yeah. and like my former friend was like, why are they taking a knee? I don't even know what they're protesting for. I'm like, where have you been? They, you know, and, and this is someone who had an Obama sticker on their Prius. Like, and this is, this is, but yeah. they're, <laughs> they own an expensive place in Santa Monica. They have a nice home that they bought 20 years ago. That's now worth a million something. So I don't yeah. know that they realize what's coming. And then when society collapses in cities like Los Angeles, you've got, all the street gangs, which, which have weapons, you've got like the Mexican mafia, the Russian mafia, the street gangs, you've got a fair amount of white nationalists there that are very secretive. What, what happens then? Like when, and you, you, some dipshit neoliberal is going to tell me Nancy Pelosi is fighting for her. <laughs> no, I mean, Graham, Listen, I'm glad you didn't go into that supermarket. And if you are hungry, you should call up Nancy because she'll feed you. <laughs> and uh, that's something important to think about. But yeah, I, I, listen, those moves right there, um, uh, really to tell you the truth, I mean, I, I I don't know how we we get out of this situation. You know, I mean, right now it's still that quiet before the storm. But what does happen in February? You know what I'm saying? The economy is going to open it back up. You know, It's not going to open up the way it was no, before. How can you are going to be starving? It's it's so, and that's the other thing we forgot to put in there. The COVID yeah. numbers are spiking again. Yeah, like we're going into the winter. They've been saying the winter, the second, and every every big virus, Spanish flu, all of them. The second wave is the worst. They said we're going into the winter, so you're going to have COVID. You have all these people because capitalism is so broken. Everyone's like, we got to open up all these yep. states are opening up. Hawaii just opened up. All these tourists are coming. It, it, like people, they have no, it's going to be this perfect storm of absolute chaos. And I don't think people get it. I think they just, like you say, they want to go back to the great distraction and say, Oh, it's not that big of a deal. You guys are overreacting. Yeah. All right. Again, I hope I'm wrong. I will take no joy in saying, I told you so when a country goes up in smoke, but this looks like, a combination of the decades of racism that were in Yugoslavia, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the class warfare of like Northern Ireland in the 70s, all rolled into one. Plus climate collapse. Oh, yeah. There's that one one. <laughs> and let me tell you something. Joe Biden is not going to ban fracking. Oh, I know that's like, come on. Harris looked into the camera. Yeah. Three times in the VP. Three debate. Time. We're not Joe Biden's not going to ban fracking. I was like, and then no. she tweeted it immediately following the debate. <laughs> she tweeted it just in case you didn't hear. Hey, guy, uh, Graham, in case you didn't hear Kamala Harris just tweeted two seconds after the debate ended. You know, she was waving people and putting it on her Twitter as right. You know, when she was finishing the debate, she put it on there just to make sure you heard he is not going to ban fracking. And how could she say that? Wasn't she one of the co-sponsors of AOC's watered down corporatist green new deal of sorts in the Senate? Another Wasn't fallout. she? Yeah. It was convenient for her in the primary, but right. come general baby. Oh, nom, 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 nom. Backtrack, track. backtrack. <laughs> yeah. It's I'm voting for the other Joe Biden. That's it. <laughs> Listen, fat. Um, I, <laughs> that's <laughs> Joe Biden. I, Watching those two debates, I was like, these were, these were Republican debates. Like there was the two, this was like a Republican and a fascist debating Republican like, policy from the 1980s. Yeah. 
I mean, I think yeah. I think they're both fascists in their own right. I they mean, are, I, yeah. I just think, you know, yeah. the Democrats are crypto fascists. The Republicans are outright fascists. At the end of the day, they're one big aisle, one big oligarchy. And the Democrats are there to distract us, stop the progressives from getting anywhere. So we can never truly fight fascism because they stop us at every turn. I mean, if we would, we wouldn't be in this situation if Bernie Sanders had been hadn't been cheated in 2015. Exactly. We like they w like we wouldn't have any of this. Do you does that make people yeah. mad? To realize that like yeah. if hillary clinton and the dnc hadn't rigged it like, we would be have a completely different world right now it completely but russia but russia but russia and now bernie sanders's movement has completely upfolded on itself and people are so disillusioned too with him with every politician that has literally who voted for the cares act who literally again gave the largest transfer of wealth to the one percent he can talk about the one percent all he wants but come on like yeah. what like what what is voting for joe biden going to do for anybody at this rate this is like that is that is says nothing we we need to be focused on on what's happening right now the economy all these people all these all this mass civil unrest all the direct actions that could be accomplished if we said hey we need to get these 10 demands right now or else we're going to halt the economy yeah period yeah. like that's that's what we should be talking about but we're not talking about that because people are too busy fighting about why they need to vote for joe biden or not and yeah. now and this is where america fails this is where we don't do what the french would do this is where we don't do what other any other country would have done right now they're censoring their their free speech they're not giving you health care during a pandemic. They're not giving you crap regarding rent and evictions. They're not doing anything for you. So why aren't you out in the streets protesting that? Why yeah. is there only like 50 people protesting for Black Lives in Beverly Hills? Where the fuck is everybody else? Yeah. That's what yeah. I want to know. Yeah, yeah. And well, they're not the... going to go there until yeah. they get uncomfortable enough. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think that has to happen for people to actually fight back. Yeah. And if you haven't seen this right now, what's going on with this with this COVID situation, the way we've been treating, we have zero friends in Washington. We have zero friends in our Congress. We have no help whatsoever. You know, it's hard for me to even argue with Fiorella when she says, hey, man, you better get out of that electorate. That's not the only way to go. And in fact, it's not the way to go at all right now. Our ass needs to get out into the streets because we get no love, no help, nothing from these people over here. And it, it, it's just it's scary, scary, scary times. I don't know what's to come. I mean, just. Save a seat for me over there. You might see it sooner than later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I, I, it's, it's all these people that right now, you know, they maybe they protested a little bit in June and they're back to brunch and they're watching the game or whatever. They're going to be forced on the street one way or another because the evictions are coming. The, the, oh, yeah. the, the economic collapse is coming and they're going to have to, they're going to be forced. And, and if they don't wake up, I don't know what. And then I think the ruling class understands this, which is why the ruling class is doing spending so much time. And they've always done this, but they're really zeroing in on trying to make this seem like a race war to distract mm -hmm. people from the fact that it's a class war, not to diminish yeah. the systemic racism in this country. Right. But as you saw in Beverly Hills, it wasn't, you know, there was people of color sitting at brunch going, oh, you kids, go get jobs, you know, and they're sitting there probably like Pasa said, having brunch on their credit card because they want to pretend that they're fancy and rich and they can't afford it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens again. Like I like like we all said, I hope we're all wrong. I would love to be wrong, but it's it's if yeah. I and you and all these other experts are right. America has no idea what's coming. It has no idea. It has no idea what it's what it's going to look like. Yeah. And, well, maybe yeah. when these evictions happen and it's a lot more rainbowish out there, a lot of these you know white people realize too as well that they're not safe. And you know everybody understands like, hey man, we're all in this together because we're all homeless right now. Maybe we'll see a great leader emerge of sorts and just you know come together. I don't know. I mean, well, they realize you know, that the, the 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 it's these fuckers at the top, the corporations, the yeah. elites, the the billionaires that we have to go after. The yeah. Jeff Bezos of the world, the Bill Gates of the world. It's those people yeah. who run the, the strings behind the scenes, who also run the politicians. The politicians are just puppets at this point. Yeah. And so once people start seeing that, um, that's that's what they don't want. This is why they're polarizing the media on the right and polarizing the media on the Democratic left, which isn't even the left. But, you know, they're, they're putting their own little narrative spins on everything to keep people polarized, to keep people from realizing who the real enemy is. And once people realize who the real enemy is, that's it, game over. 
That's yeah. and and they know this. Yeah, and, and where's all the money going? You know, we're still dropping bombs in Afghanistan as we speak. That budget's still going up, and the Democrats, Adam Smith, and in, in from Washington, you know, what I'm saying he was the chairman of the committee writing out the bills, whatnot. They're going close to 800 billion next time, whatnot. So I mean, bombs are still dropping. People are starving. You know, we have no health care here in America during a pandemic. And then people are trying to push a guy who says he'll veto health care and he's not going to ban fracking. Where the hell are we? We are lost. Yeah, we have no leadership. There's no. Leadership. That's why it's all breaking off in all these fractions and these white nationalists and everybody. It's it's because there's no leadership. So people then run out to the extremes and the fringes and yeah. and whatever else. So, yeah. Um, well, I really appreciate the work you uh, are doing. And I know uh, YouTube has put you on a strike for this week. So it's another reason for everybody to go check you out on Rockfin, so which is a platform I'm on. It's blockchain. It's cryptocurrency. You can sign up to Rockfin for free and watch anybody on the platform's free content. I got plenty, plenty of free videos. And for $9.99 a month, basically 10 bucks a month, you get access to everybody's premium content. So, um, and then we all get paid with cryptocurrency. So check that out. Uh, so, uh, fee and pasta, where can people, um, follow you and support you and, and do all that? I, 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 of course, Rockfin, uh, but where else? Well, go ahead. I was, oh, I was going to say, you know, uh, Graham, I just want to say also, I'm glad that you sold out to big kale over big honey. Uh, I, I never liked the fact that you were a bee apologist. So I'm very happy about that. So up the kale and send us some. He still is obnoxious about the V. The, the most like, obnoxious is right there. Because yeah. I don't, you know. Yeah, new V. Like that. <laughs> Even though he ate meat for like 40 something years. I haven't okay. done it since I've been open <laughs> since I saw okay. the vegan Jesus or, you know, like, ah, oh, like understanding it and stuff. I love it. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, you know about the Rockfin. The Rockfin is still the most important thing. Please, ladies and gentlemen, get over to that Rockfin. I, I really can't stress it enough because of, you know, the behaviors of, of big tech and what they do with, you know, we're on Facebook, you know, we have a Twitter, we have a Twitch, but Twitch is owned by Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. How long can you count on them? So yeah, you can hit us up on all those other outlets, Twitch, Twitter, uh, Facebook, if you like, but please, I can't stress it enough. Get on over to our rock fan. If you have a few bucks, uh, we do have that PayPal. And we do all have a Patreon as well. And, and, and we look for look forward to seeing you. And, and Graham, too, as well. I, you know what? I just had this thought here and stuff because we all, you know, when we started this thing, isn't this situation, wasn't this whole situation as I saw this today, wasn't this really tailor-made for Bernie Sanders? This shit was tailor-made yep. for him. And it's just a shame. We need some help. But this was just like a setup. When you set it up and somebody can spike it down, man, did we miss the opportunity. He, he quit it. at the worst moment I've ever seen. Even if he wouldn't, let's say he still got screwed in 2016, but now he was the candidate. He was the Democratic nominee. Imagine everyone would be like, oh, this is a slam dunk. He's going to give us health care. He's going to give us UBI. He's going to do all these things. He was put literally in the perfect moment in history. That debate on March 15th, everything had just been shut down. America was shut down. The numbers were spiking in New York City. COVID had finally hit America, and America was like, oh, God, COVID is real. That debate, that last one with Joe Biden, and he went soft, and my friend Joe Biden, and then a couple of days later, he quit. That was a moment. That, that debate right there was the moment we would be talking about for years to come. Bernie went, okay. I see this moment in history, step forward. I'm the leader. I'm the guy that can beat Trump. I'm the guy that can get us through COVID. Imagine right now if Bernie was just constantly hitting that message because he could talk about student debt forgiveness. I don't know if people realize this. 85% of all student debt is federal. But the president, by executive order, doesn't need Congress, can just sign a piece of paper, boom, couple trillion dollars in debt, gone infused back into the economy, Bernie could saying, I will make sure you won't get evicted. If I'm president, I will, t I will save your homes. I will save your businesses. I will, I will have better testing. I will have PPP. We will have masks made in America, whatever, man, my green new deal is going to get us out of this. He could be doing all of this. And instead he quit to support Joe Biden. So he's now like this really efficient tweeter. He's a like, he's a quitter. I'm, I'm just the Democratic Party, AOC, all of them. They're fucking bullshit. They're all bullshit. And it, it's not going to matter about this, this kangaroo court election that's going to happen. And 
you know, unfortunately, it's going to take everybody getting evicted to stop them. They don't, when they can't afford brunch and they're living in their car, they might show up at a protest. Yeah. Can't so say <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time. And I really appreciate the work. You guys do fantastic work and uh, shout out to Johnny on the ones and twos there. And uh, we will, uh, we'll, we'll have you back on the show soon. And whenever you want me to come back on the couch, uh, okay. let me program. know. Uh, yeah. We'll do something on election day, even if it's, you know, just on Rockfin. We'll be going live. We'll be on each other's shows. We'll make that happen. Yeah, we yeah, will. Yeah. Graham, thank you so much for uh, getting us on. You know, this censorship thing is really, really scary. And, uh, you know, the fact is like YouTube has done situations where they've gone in and given people three strikes at one time. Like, oh, we changed our rules of engagement. What do you, what do you call it? the guidelines, the community guidelines? Go on in there, grab three videos of old, pull them out and say, now your channel's done. Yeah. So, you know, believe you me, I'm as frightened as can be. Uh, and I really do appreciate you putting us on your show so we can get the news out there, whatnot, and get more people on that Rockfin uh, to get some protections. Because unfortunately, uh, censorship and fascism is just running wild in America, and uh, the journalism is is under attack, and it sucks. And people and don't we realize, have a PayPal, guys. Yeah, uh, go to there. So support their show, support indie media, pasta fee. Thank you so much for coming on Thank the you, show, Graham. and we'll see you soon. Wait, here comes Johnny Sue. Hey! Oh, Johnny, look at that beautiful young man. Look at that. That's the convo family right there. Look at them. Good to see We're going to go make some vegan food now, Graham. All Bye, right. Stay away from the honey, big kale. All right. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you.